Hello and welcome to Classical Mechanics 2. In this video, we'll take a closer look at the inverse square law problem using Hamiltonian formalism. We'll start out by deriving an unexpected constant of the motion that we will use to find that there's actually a hidden symmetry in these systems. But what is a constant of motion? A constant of motion is a combination of terms that remains unchanged throughout the dynamics of the system. Previously, we used Noether's theorem to look at the symmetries of the Lagrangian as a way to derive conserved quantities. Here we're going to take a more Hamiltonian approach and look at some constants within the phase space of our system. To derive this particular constant of motion, we'll basically be doing algebra to solve for a first integral of the system. The equation of motion for an inverse square law system is given by the reduced mass mu times r double dot is equal to minus the force constant gamma divided by r squared, and this force acts in the r hat direction. Since there are no tangential forces in this system, angular momentum must be conserved. The angular momentum L is equal to R cross the momentum, which is mu times the velocity R dot. Now we're going to do something that's a little strange. We're going to take the cross product of the force equation with the angular momentum. It's not obvious at this stage why this makes any sense, but I promise that the algebra will lead us somewhere interesting. We're going to expand the r hat term using its definition, the vector r divided by its magnitude. Then the left hand side of the equation gives us r double dot cross the angular momentum l. And the right hand side is minus gamma divided by r cubed times r cross r cross r dot. I've divided both sides through by a factor of mu. There's one factor of mu coming from the left side of the equation, and the other factor of mu is coming from the linear momentum component of the angular momentum. I'm going to expand this vector triple product using the back cab rule, which gives us minus gamma divided by r cubed is equal to r dot r dot times r minus r dot r times r dot. It turns out that this term is a total derivative. So we'll use our favorite trick and undo the chain rule. And we find that this is equal to minus gamma times the rate of change of the vector r divided by its magnitude, which is just minus gamma times the rate of change of r hat. Our goal now is to rewrite the left-hand side to make it look like it's the derivative of time. Then we can use that to find a constant of the motion. Since angular momentum is conserved, the rate of change of angular momentum is zero, which means that the only time derivative needs to act on r double dot. So we can pull out a factor of the time derivative and we get d by dt of r dot cross l is equal to minus gamma times d by dt of r hat. Now I can integrate both sides and I end up with r dot cross l is equal to gamma times r hat plus a constant of integration, which we'll call a. Then our constant of integration, which is a constant of the motion, a is equal to r dot cross l divided by gamma minus r hat. This constant of the motion a, which is equal to r dot cross the angular momentum divided by the force constant gamma minus r hat, is a vector that points to the direction of the perigee of the orbit. It turns out that this vector is called the laplace runge lenz vector, often just called the runge lenz vector. And this is ironic because none of these three discovered it. In fact, it has been rediscovered many times throughout history. Since this vector is a constant of the motion, then by definition, a dot is equal to zero. But we'd like a more physical interpretation of what this is. We'll start by taking the dot product of a with r. This gives us the projection of a into the r hat direction. We'll expand out the terms on the right, which gives us r dot cross l dotted into r divided by gamma minus r hat dotted into r. The second term here is just the magnitude of r, but we'll have to use a vector identity to show that any even permutation of this vector triple product gives us the same answer. From that, we get r cross r dot dotted into the angular momentum divided by gamma minus the magnitude of r. 
the term r cross r dot is just the angular momentum divided by the mass mu. Then the right hand side of the equation is l divided by mu dotted into l divided by gamma minus r. And from the definition of the dot product, the left hand side now is equal to a r cosine theta, which is equal to the magnitude of the angular momentum squared divided by gamma times mu minus r. If we rearrange this to solve for the radius r, we recover the equation of the orbit. r is equal to the angular momentum squared divided by the force constant gamma times the reduced mass mu times 1 divided by 1 plus a times cosine theta, where the magnitude of a plays the part of the eccentricity of the orbit epsilon. It's not surprising that the eccentricity of the orbit would be a conserved quantity of the system. After all, it is a quantity that defines the shape of the orbit and therefore cannot change throughout the dynamics. So what does any of this have to do with Hamiltonian mechanics? We just did a little vector algebra to arrive at these results. To answer that question, we'll have to do a little aside on Poisson brackets. Poisson brackets are the classical analog of the quantum mechanical commutator. We'll start with a set of canonical coordinates on phase space, some generalized positions qi and their corresponding generalized momenta pi. Imagine we have two functions on phase space, f, which is a function of the qi's, pi's, and time, and g, which is also a function of the qi's, pi's, and time. Then the definition of the Poisson bracket, which is written as f, g in curly braces, is given by the sum from i equals 1 to n of df by dqi times dg by dpi minus df by dpi times dg by dqi. We can take the Poisson bracket of any functions we'd like, but we'll start with the simplest functions q and p. The Poisson bracket of qi and qj is zero, since neither depend on pi, so both of these derivatives will be zero. Likewise, the Poisson bracket of pi with pj is also equal to zero. The only term that survives the Poisson bracket of qi with pj is dqi by dqi times dpi by dpi, and this term over here is equal to zero. So we get 1 when i equals j and 0 otherwise, and we can write this compactly using the Kronecker delta. This last statement here, the Poisson bracket of qi with pj is equal to delta ij, is the definition of qi and pj being conjugate coordinates. This is a concept that you may encounter later if you take a course in statistical mechanics. If the functions q of t and p of t are solutions to Hamilton's equations, then q dot is equal to dh by dp, and p dot is equal to minus dh by dq, by definition. But the first equation here is equal to the Poisson bracket of q with the Hamiltonian. We can see this if we plug in q for f and the Hamiltonian for g. Then dq by dq times dh by dp is just equal to dh by dp. And the second term, dq by dp times dh by dq is equal to zero. The second equation is equal to the Poisson bracket of p with the Hamiltonian. The first term here is zero because dp by dq is zero. But the second term here gives us minus dp by dp, which is one times dh by dq. Now we'll explore what the Poisson brackets have to do with the constants of motion. Let's take some function f, which is a function of the canonical coordinates and time. Then the total derivative of f with respect to time is equal to df by dq times dq by dt plus df by dp times dp by dt plus df by dt. Then from the definition of Hamilton's equations, this is equal to df by dq times dh by dp minus df by dp times dh by dq plus df by dt. The first two terms here are just the Poisson bracket of f with the Hamiltonian. So the total derivative of f with respect to time is equal to the Poisson bracket of f with the Hamiltonian plus the rate of change of f. Then formally, the time evolution of f is a one-parameter family of canonical transformations. 
That means that f evolves with a single parameter, which in this case is time, according to some transformations of phase space that preserve area. This is just Liouville's theorem all over again. That means that the time evolution of a region in phase space is just given by this formula. There's additionally a relationship between the total number of degrees of freedom of the system, that is the number of Q's and P's, and the number of constants of motion. Each constant of motion effectively removes one degree of freedom from the system. So if we start with a system with n degrees of freedom and k constants of motion, the system behaves as if it has n minus k degrees of freedom. That means we only have to solve for the dynamics on a lower dimensional submanifold within phase space. This is the generalization of the notion of ignorable coordinates. So what sorts of things preserve the motion? One thing that preserves the motion is the Hamiltonian. That is, Hamiltonian motion is preserved under the Poisson brackets. We can integrate the equations of motion to find that Q of t is equal to e to the minus t times the Poisson bracket of the Hamiltonian with the motion times the initial value of Q, and the equivalent relationship holds for the generalized momentum. You might recognize this as solutions to the time-dependent Schrodinger equation in quantum mechanics, only with the commutator instead of the Poisson bracket. Then, if some function f of q and p is a constant of the motion and does not depend on time, then the Poisson bracket of f with the Hamiltonian is equal to zero. Let's have a look at Kat Movisegi's poster again. Here they're using the two-body problem, which we've been calling the inverse square law system, to illustrate the relationship between the Poisson bracket and the symmetries in the system. Here they're using the coordinate free version of the Poisson bracket, which is the wedge product. The symmetries of the system are expressed using this Lie group notation here. In this poster, they're using the wedge product to dimensionally reduce the system. This formalism using the geometric structure of phase space broadly works for all Hamiltonian problems. We're essentially lucky that people have studying this in we're essentially lucky that people have been studying this inverse square law problem for centuries to have arrived at the explicit algebraic description that I derived for you. It turns out that the Runge lens vector does actually have a physical interpretation. Let's start out in this orbit. It has energy E and eccentricity epsilon. It turns out that there is a continuous set of transformations that keeps the energy constant but changes the eccentricity of the orbit. Here's a new orbit that has the same energy, but a different eccentricity. These two orbits also have the same angular momentum. In these two orbits, the speed of a satellite in these orbits is the same when it's at a fixed distance from the focus of the orbits. The Runge lens vector is the constant of this transformation, but that means there's some set of symmetries we haven't accounted for that gives rise to this constant of motion. First, we'll look at the relationship between symmetry and the conservation of angular momentum. We did this once before using Noether's theorem and Lagrangian mechanics. Here, we'll take a look at what these statements mean using the Hamiltonian formalism. Since our system is in three-dimensional Euclidean space, R3, we have some rotational symmetry. That means that the system looks the same under the action of some group. In this case, that group is going to be SO3, which is the group of three-dimensional rotations. Since this group is three-dimensional, this means that we have three corresponding conserved quantities, and these are the three components of the conserved angular momentum. The algebra produced by the Poisson bracket of the angular momentum is the same as the Lie algebra for SO3. But the inverse square law also has three additional conserved quantities. The three components of the Runge lens vector are also conserved. So what is the corresponding symmetry? Well, I know that the angular momentum is conserved, and I know that A is conserved, but for the sake of making this algebra easier, I'm going to write down a new vector K, which is basically a rescaling of the Runge lens vector A by energy. Since both the Runge lens vector and the Hamiltonian are constants of the motion, then so is K. We can work out the algebra of the Poisson brackets for these conserved quantities. First, the Poisson bracket of L1 with L2 is equal to L3, and this holds for all cyclic permutations of 1, 2, 3. Likewise, the Poisson bracket of L1 with K2 is equal to K3, and this holds for all cyclic permutations of 1, 2, 3. 
And lastly, the Poisson bracket of K1 with K2 is plus or minus K3, where plus or minus depends on the total energy. If the energy is negative, then we use the plus sign. And if the energy is positive, we use the minus sign. This now gives us an algebraic structure for the relationships between the conserved quantities. And it turns out that these relationships here are the generators for rotational symmetry in four-dimensional Euclidean space. We started with a problem in 3D and found that it actually has a symmetry in four dimensions. That's pretty incredible. When the energy is negative, the symmetry group SO4 is the group of rotations in four-dimensional Euclidean space. This has six independent parameters, which correspond to the three components of the conserved angular momenta and the three components of the conserved Runge lens vector. When the energy is positive, the symmetry group is called SO31. This is the group of rotations of R31, which is Lorentz space. The one in both of these terms here corresponds to the minus sign in the group operation earlier. This is secretly the reason that all orbits coming from the inverse square law systems are conic sections. This animation illustrates how one might get a conic section by projecting a higher dimensional orbit into two dimensions. Obviously, I can't draw R4 for you, but hopefully this gives you an idea of what is happening behind the scenes. It turns out that beyond showing us that there is a hidden four-dimensional symmetry in this simple problem, the Runge lens vector was used to predict the energy levels of the hydrogen atom even before Schrodinger's equation was known. I'll put a link in the description to an article by Greg Egan on this topic. A lot of this story comes from some blog posts by both Greg Egan and John Baez. I'll link to them below. In the next video, we'll be switching gears to start thinking about what happens if we have an extended body rotating in space. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.